Hello, everyone. This is World Review with Evo Dalder, a weekly look at news around the world from, produced by the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. It's Friday, January 5th, our first episode of World Review in the new year. And what a new year it's going to be. 2024 is a year of elections from uh, presidential elections in Taiwan next Sunday, a lot of European elections, including for the European Parliament in the summer. And of course, to top it all off, the U.S. presidential election on November 5th. With so many elections going around, politics will, of course, play a big role in foreign policy decisions by major and not so major powers. And that's certainly true on some of the big stories we want to focus on this week. Let's start with Ukraine. Next week, Congress will come back to Washington, and one of the first orders of business is whether to vote or not on a package that President Biden put forward back in October to help provide aid to Ukraine, to Israel, for Palestinian humanitarian relief, and for the defense of Taiwan. So far, no vote because, and here comes the politics, uh, the ultimate decision is not on whether aid is necessary for these three places. It is, but whether there will be an agreement between Democrats and Republicans in the Senate and in the House on border security measures, an issue that is now red hot politically, uh, not least because 300,000 people streamed across the southern border just last month. Politics is also going to play a role in the Middle East, both on how Israel deals with the emerging domestic divisions, which exploded uh, just today in a discussion uh, that came out of the cabinet yesterday, uh, on how to deal with the war and how to prevent uh, further escalation. And domestic politics is playing a role in how the U.S. is responding as President Biden is facing increasing criticism within his own political party of his uh, embrace of Israel over the past three months. And finally, true politics. Elections in Taiwan uh, may determine whether there will be a crisis there, the third region in uh, our, our orbit here. China will decide how it to respond if, as seems likely, the current front runner, William Lai, Vice President William Lai of the Democratic Progressive Party, wins that election. So here to talk about these issues are three people who uh, are following these stories. Susan Glasser, staff writer of The New Yorker, Peter Spiegel, U.S. editor of The Financial Times, and Stefan Cornelius, political editor of the Süddeutsche Zeitung. Happy New Year, all three of you. Wonderful to have you all on the show. Great to see you back here. Uh, Stefan, let's start with you. Politics in Ukraine. I did not mention uh, European politics, which is also, of course, having a huge impact uh, on what's happening in, in Ukraine. But bring us up to date uh, where we are with the situation in Ukraine and, and particularly the economic and military aid uh, that is so critical. Uh, for Ukraine to be able to defend itself and to have an economy that is keeps on running. Right, Eva. Well, there's so much to mention and so many things we have to leave out, starting with the elections in North Korea, by the way, which are decided. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, well, there will be many elections in Europe, and there was supposed to be an election in Ukraine, a presidential election, and the president himself has put them off for the reason of the war, of the country being at war and not being able to go to elections. Now, the past weeks basically have, um, haven't changed the, 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 the layout on the field and on the, on the political, um, landscape at all. Uh, we have seen a stormy politically and militarily. Politically, we have seen the EU now freezing on questions of funding on, 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 and, and military aid, uh, mostly Ukraine, uh, uh, the, the Hungarian government vetoing a joint EU package of 50 billion. We've seen the American uh, stalemate, which you mentioned, in Congress. And we have seen uh, on the military front in the past weeks um, a war of attrition. France really haven't moved a lot. We have seen the Ukrainians. Um, uh, in a bitter defense operation against uh, Russian air assault, mostly from a, a hail of uh, of, of uh, long range missiles coming down on Kiev and other major cities. Um, and the question now comes up: How long is the country able to sustain this? How long is the country able to fend it off? Uh, how long will the military aid, the support, the procurement support uh, last, and how long will the monetary support actually last to for the country to survive? 
obviously Vladimir Putin is playing on this uh, hopes and he has shown a lot of self-confidence over the past weeks. We have watched him closely on his various public outings, which he had, most importantly, the, the yearly press conference shortly before Christmas, then over New Year's Day, his various public um, appearances. So, uh, occasions he showed an extreme self-confidence, which basically points to the fact that he now has his narrative in place, which still frames the West as the aggressor against Russia, which Russia has to defend um, uh, for uh, the West being behind uh, uh, the war in Ukraine and in reverse, Russia being um, forced to defend itself against the West. So Ukraine wasn't actually mentioned in these public uh, outings by Putin at all. It's this us, it's the West, it's the US, it is uh, Europe. And so the, the three West, as he cynically says all the time. Um, and so here we go um, in a year which is uh, uh, definitely um, uh, labeled by all those elections in Europe and in the United States. Uh, actually in Russia too, Putin will himself uh, put himself on, on the ballot or actually parliament will be voted for in that president. And uh, there's a question that, uh, that he and his party were uh, in the majority again. But um, a lot of hopes are pinned to these elections because Putin might use elections as a pretext to to make a political change, to announce something which we are not expecting yet. Um, all those unknown unknowns are basically what we're hoping for this year, either militarily, domestically, within Russia, probably in the worst case, even domestically within Ukraine where tensions are mounting between the military and Zelensky himself. Zelensky is as weak as you can imagine. Um, he's desperately trying to support more, um, uh, um, well, uh, aid from, from wherever in the world, but he's weakening, definitely. So here we go in a, an extremely unpredictable year where uh, we cannot expect anything changing on the, on the front line militarily. We have seen some major hits again by Ukraine on Crimea zone. Even this morning, we had rumors that the Russian Joint Chief of Staff Karasimov would have uh, was supposed to be killed in one of those attacks. Nothing has been confirmed. So it's a big, big rumor. A lot of things swirling around. So be careful what you uh, hope for and wish for. But nevertheless, in the end, this year is all about getting it over. It is about finding out where we stand at the end when. The Americans have voted when the U.S. has gone to the polls and the decision will be made whether the United States will be able to uh, um, stay to its commitments to, uh, versus Ukraine and as well as the European Union, which goes to the polls on June 6th. So the European Union's decision, the Americans' decision, whether we can sustain it democratically, politically, whether there will be a majority in the West to support Ukraine will be decisive for the outcome. We haven't really thought about the flip side, what's, what's actually happening if we can't, uh, if we actually will lose this war. And this is now something which is sinking in, and my guess is it will occupy the political debate over the next weeks. Are we actually prepared to lose it? Yeah, I, Stefan, I, uh, 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 this last point, uh, Susan, that Stefan makes, I think is is sort of it all adds up to that. Uh, I th if you look back to a year ago, in, uh, the beginning of 2023, you know, the, the Ukrainians had made those major advances in the summer and in the fall, they re regained Kershon and, and, and all these, and it was a look, uh, the, the counteroffensive was coming and this was going to be the decisive year. Well, it turned out not to be. Um, and, and now the, the narrative is stalemate. But is that the right narrative? Uh, given the economic and, and political uh, and military uncertainties facing Ukraine today. Uh, is it possible that this is the year the war is lost? Well, that's a sobering thought, Ivo, to start the year off on. I, you know, I, I would disagree a little bit in the sense that I would say, unfortunately, stalemate was probably always the, the, the smarter um, bet uh, for all the structural reasons that, that everyone, you know, on this, conversation knows quite well, um, well uh, Ukraine, Ukraine overperformed and surprised the world in the, in the early uh, days and weeks of this conflict. But in reality, uh, some form of stalemate uh, from the very beginning, you know, was actually anticipated, you know, by the people who, who understood 
what both sides brought, uh, you know, to a longer term conflict and the politics. I'm glad you've sort of framed this conversation around that because, of course, the politics have been both a constraint and a shaper, uh, I, I think, of that very uh, stalemate outcome. Uh, and certainly people will be second guessing forever. Uh, you know, was there sufficient support from the United States and Europe uh, at a time when more advantage could have been taken from those uh, early gains back by Ukraine? Uh, we'll never know the answer, of course. Uh, there are many people, not just in Ukraine, who believe that is the case. Uh, and now, uh, I, you know, on the, on the other side, you, there is a lot that I'm hearing from military analysts about the strengths that Russia will bring uh, this year, that this is a year for Ukraine militarily to be on the defensive, which of course is going to have enormous political repercussions. And uh, Zelensky, the master of PR and communications has been aware of that. That's why you see, I think these escalating kind of guerrilla operations, non-conventional operations, talking about uh, victories in the Black Sea, while uh, amazing in some ways and important, they, they don't really change the, you know, the overall outcome of the war and the real imperative for Ukraine to get Russia off its territory. And so, you know, basically, I, I subscribe to the stalemate view, at least for the remains of this year. One addendum I would make, Evo, to your framing around what's happening here in Washington when it comes to the prospect for uh, in the short to medium term further aid. Because, of course, Stefan is right. The big question is what happens in our election in November. And obviously, it is an existential matter for Ukraine. If Donald Trump wins re-election, I think not only does the prospect of the war being lost have to be addressed, but the prospect of Ukraine as a meaningful, functioning, independent state will have to be addressed by Europe and by all those who remain committed to it. I mean, it's that serious. And I think that people are not serious. Honestly, I feel that they're not actually serious about uh, dealing with this in part because there are so many potential uh, sort of tectonic consequences of a Trump victory. But this one in particular is one given that we can anticipate, probably a lot more thought should be given to it. In the short term, I have to say that uh, it's a fantasy, the idea that um, the United States House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats are going to just suddenly, magically, at the beginning of a presidential election year uh, with Donald Trump, Mr. Immigration Demagogue on the ballot, uh, go ahead and make a sweeping universal deal on the border that's also going to unlock $60 billion in aid for Ukraine. This is a fantasy. In fact, it's it's such a fantasy that the coverage of it is wildly distracting, in my view, because, in fact, it's making people think that there's some sort of possible outcome, that there isn't a possible outcome. So what can happen? Uh, it's possible uh, at some point because... Uh, even if there is a shutdown, which, by the way, we have not one but two government shutdowns looming here in Washington in the early part of the year. Uh, you know, there will be short term funding bills uh, and there's always the possibility of including some uh, additional aid for Ukraine in that. I, I think the realistic money here in Washington at this point is on nothing like the $60 billion that Biden uh, recommended in the fall. And I just finish by pointing out that, you know, people do tend to focus on, well, what if we had, they're second guessing on weapon systems. Uh, I, I think there's a real second guessing to be made on the political judgments, uh, uh, unfortunately, that informed a White House decision, uh, both to delay too long and asking for additional Ukraine aid back uh, when there was the, the votes and uh, less political scrutiny over the summer would have been the time to do it. And then this almost catastrophic decision in, in October to link Ukraine to the border, the single most divisive issue in American politics for well more than a decade. Uh, whoever came up with that brilliant idea, <laughs> I, I don't have a name uh, for you, but uh, I think it's, it's something that unfortunately for the history of Ukraine struggle, uh, it, it's going to loom large. God, I'm depressed. I might just go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I think the name uh, for, for who linked that uh, is the Senate majority, uh, uh, the Senate minority leader, uh, who did propose it and thought that that's how we could get it through, right? Uh, 
by having the border and Israel and Ukraine all together and Taiwan, by the way, uh, we could get it through. And uh, this, but the, the miscalculation seems to be all over the place. But Peter, uh, not only depressing. Uh, give us. Do you have any any more upside? Or you? you well, agree? let me let me try to play slightly optimistic. I, I, I mean, Susan's closer to the story there than I am, but I, I think. You know, and I made the rounds in Washington. I think last time I was on the show, I talked a bit about this. I mean, the amount of pessimism coming out of both Republican and Democrat, I will say natural security Republicans and, 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 and Democratic leaders about the prospect of a, of a deal on the border was just so overwhelming that I'm sure Susan is right. But let me, let me try to play slightly a devil's advocate here. And I'm not even sure I'm going to believe what I'm going to say. But the fact of the matter is, um, if we look at domestic politics, I think the, the Biden campaign realizes that they could lose a huge amount of support on the issue of immigration. Um, the Democrats in general have gotten immigration wrong politically, and there is a case to be made that if he looks strong on the border, and Obama did this, right, uh, to, to the criticism of, of a lot of people on, on the Democratic left, if he's at least can just shore up his 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 policies on immigration, perhaps he can go into 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 November neutralizing it. So there is some incentive for Biden to strike a hardline deal with the Republicans on immigration, which may unlock um, the the aid, and I think that's that that's the hope there. Now, you know whether that loses the left uh, remains to be seen. And he's obviously already struggling with the left on, on our next topic, Israel Hamas. Um, so it is a very narrow window he's going to have to get through. Um, the other thing I'm optimistic, and I want to throw it back to Stefan with a question on this one, is despite the fact that Viktor Orban, the Hungarian Prime Minister, basically blocked the economic aid coming out of the European Council last year. There is an emergency summary coming in in February. Um, the, there is a workaround there. And there does seem to be a way that the EU, at least, will be able to provide some aid. And, and so I guess, Stefan, my question for you, because you raised this about sort of the everyone waiting for Godot in the U.S., right? We're, we're all going to wait for the November election. It strikes me just having been in Brussels for the 2014 Ukraine crisis, where you had in the singular figure, figure of Angela Merkel a leader who could actually lead on this issue, even without Obama uh, and some divisions within the, the Obama administration on Russia policy, she was able to sort of lead not only Europe, but the West on this. There is no Angela Merkel. Um, the, the German government right now is weak and divided. Um, there seems to be a lack of leadership within Europe. If the worst happens, the U.S. does not pass the legislation and in November elects Donald Trump. I'm just curious if there's any prospect for a, I mean, Olaf Scholz, I don't think is the, is the guy, but where do you see political leadership coming from Europe, if at all? In, in the prospect that the Americans just have sent themselves uh, from a, a Ukrainian endgame? Well, I wouldn't underestimate Olaf Scholz, uh, even though he plays a different uh, card game here. Uh, the German government, at least the chancellery, not the foreign minister, the Korean Angela Baerbock, he, Scholz, is committed to a kind of negotiate, negotiated peace with Russia, even though there is nothing to negotiate, and uh, Vladimir Putin is ever eager to negotiate anything right now. Um, but you're entirely right, Peter. The the, the EU is uh, actually the thing to to watch right now. Uh, the money shortage can be bypassed. There is work going on. Uh, Viktor Orban is uh, betting on the wrong horse if he's hoping that he can single handedly keep the EU uh, paralyzed. So this is being solved, I guess, by February. And the Ukraine itself is um, making huge efforts to uh, increase its wartime production, its weapon production. So there, there is a, a tendency to get rid of this huge dependency uh, um, of the uh, United States. And even though, and Susan, you're entirely right, this is existential to Ukraine, the question on the outcome of the US election, but it's also existential for so many European countries, if NATO would prevail or not. Uh, so we we see, we see tectonic shifts in a dimension we, we can't even think of right now. But nevertheless, there's preparation for that. There's a lot of talk about this. Um, I know of internal movements within European governments, but the leadership question is key because there will be a paralyzed situation until at least June, until we have a new EU leadership. Um, Ursula von der Leyen most likely will prevail as uh, um, as as uh, uh, president of the European uh, Union of the um, uh, of the Commission. But uh, in the end, there is no national strong leader emerging. The Brits are totally paralyzed. They will have elections coming up this year. Macron is dead man walking. Um, on the Italian side, we are still doubting whether Meloni is really up to the task and whether she's playing the right hand right wing card and just waiting for Donald Trump to come into uh, into power. 
So in the end, it's up to uh, Olaf Scholz. And he, at least until now, has given the right wording in, in terms of Ukraine. He said, we'll stand there as firm as we can, as long as we can. There is always an if, but I think everyone here in Germany knows that our security, our safety, our ability to, to, to deter Russia for good uh, hangs on the line here. And it's not about Ukraine. It's about the European uh, coherence, unity, and security in the end. Yeah, so uh, it, it may be interesting to, I mean, this is, the, I think, the one thing to watch is to see if the Europeans, as they stepped up uh, after February uh, uh, 2022, uh, continue to do so. Uh, there, you know, the question of what you, whether you can actually do it without American weapons uh, on the military side is the big, the big question. But I, I'm more optimistic, uh, Stefan, like you. I think that the, at least on the economic aid and that the economic aid may be allowing more production in Ukraine for particularly shells. I'm, I'm worried about air defense missiles. Um, uh, it may, uh, it, it may just work and we can get through to the end of the year and then we'll wait for the big, the big one, uh, as Susan put it. Um, uh, and certainly that is what Vladimir Putin is waiting for. Let's, let's, uh, let's move on to, to the Middle East. Uh, you know, since we dealt with the really easy question of Ukraine, uh, <laughs> or actually the difficult question, let's do it with the easy question in the Middle East. And Susan, uh, here too, domestic politics. I mean, a big spat in the, in the, uh, Israeli cabinet, uh, last night. Uh, but also domestic politics in the United States and domestic politics in European countries. I, you know, the, 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 the repercussions, not just of October 7, but what's happened afterwards, uh, uh, Israeli actions in Gaza in particular, is just reverberating everywhere, it seems, uh, and really is going to determine how this conflict uh, will evolve. And uh, so how do you see it? Well, you're right. If you can think of one uh, issue in the world that uh, is the fusion of domestic and international politics, not only for the United States, whether that's been true for a long time, but also Europe, uh, it's clearly uh, Israel. And this this war in particular has been as inflammatory uh, in our American domestic politics as, as you can you know, ever think of really for, you know, certainly the last few decades, um, even claiming the president of Harvard this week, I think it's fair to say, uh, you know, that she was primarily a, a casualty of uh, the kind of extreme politicization surrounding uh, all things Israel in, in the context of our presidential election and our already dysfunctional politics. Uh, you know, it uh, certainly uh, wouldn't have been possible without her uh, acts of plagiarism, but um, uh, in and of themselves, that would not have uh, cost her her job and the shortest serving uh, tenure of any Harvard president going back to the uh, 17th century. So, um, you know, it, it's definitely a political issue. How much is it a worry for President Biden and his team? I continue to get the sense that uh, their short-term worries are less actually politics than they really are about the continuing prospect of serious escalation in the region. And so that's why you have a real focus on, you know, what more, uh, if anything, militarily should the United States be doing. Uh, the number, I was really struck that the number of attacks on U.S. interests in the region has already gone into the triple digits. I, that was the number uh, cited as of, I think, yesterday uh, since October 7th. That's very significant. This is a major escalation. Uh, a different president might have already uh, taken uh, more uh, proactive action uh, and calibrating you know, the risk factor there, both for Biden politically, uh, 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 you know, and this is in the middle of a Republican primary where uh, not just Donald Trump, but all the candidates are eager and will seize on any appearance of him, quote, looking weak uh, and not sufficiently uh, standing up for Israel. At the same time, there is the the disgruntled American left, uh, you know, and even many people who were quite uh, vocal in supporting Israel in the immediate aftermath of the horrific October 7th attack, what I've noticed is that there's really been a pretty distinct and pronounced shift uh, and a lot fewer uh, Democrats are out there publicly defending uh, um, Israel and the conduct of the war. Just this week, you had Bernie Sanders uh, 
putting out a statement and 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 he has been quite remarkably not a problem uh, for Joe Biden his longtime Senate colleague over the last few years right like that rift never opened up wide and their longtime relationship really helped but you had Bernie Sanders coming out this week and I it didn't get that much attention but saying you know Netanyahu's war uh has got to cease and uh that's interesting on on multiple levels. Obviously, Netanyahu is sort of a bugaboo of the American left as well as the Israeli left. Uh, And you see, talking about politics, I think escalating pressures, of course, inside Israel as well. You have people back out on the streets this week. You have uh, uh, the Israeli Supreme Court decision on doing uh, uh, Netanyahu's attempted and very controversial judicial reforms. And you have the potential at any moment for the unraveling of Netanyahu's very tenuous, very far-right coalition. And so all of that is starting to come together uh, around the debates that are broadly lumped under the heading of, quote, the day after. And I think that's a friction point uh, between the United States and uh, Israel and Netanyahu. It is the friction point within uh, the Israeli government and the Israeli politics as well. What I'm seeing so far doesn't look very viable, to be honest. Uh, so, And it's also, there's quite a wide gap between the United States, which from the beginning has more or less talked, uh, at least in a general way, about a revitalized or revamped Palestinian authority as being a potential future governing authority for Gaza after the war, at least in the short term. And then uh, Israel and its defense minister saying essentially anything but that. Uh, we we refuse to have the PA even reconstituted uh, in any form there. So I don't see any, you know, uh, consensus emerging right now, number one. Number two, the war is still very much ongoing, although Israel is, you know, spinning hard here in Washington, the idea that they are uh, withdrawing uh, some of their combat brigades from the north, if not the north of Gaza, if not as quickly as possible. And then number three, what is the broader regional picture, a big pressure point on the U.S. in terms of uh, should they go more frontally, uh, for example, at the Houthis uh, uh, in Yemen who are uh, clogging up shipping, uh, you know, actually in a way that could impact global shipping overall. I mean, it's really quite a serious thing. And then final thing to flag for you, amazing as it may seem, there's still uh, the green shoots of of hope uh, here in Washington that somehow uh, this uh, horrible conflict will not entirely uh, destroy the prospects for that bigger uh, Saudi Israel, uh, you know, kind of rapprochement and peace deal that they were ardently pursuing when October seventh happened. Obviously, I wouldn't, you know blink and look for peace to break out, uh, you know, anytime soon. But uh, it's interesting uh, that they're trying to keep the embers of that hope alive. And Lindsey Graham, uh, uh, in fact, is in the region this week uh, talking to Netanyahu and going uh, to Saudi tomorrow to speak with MBS as well. Emo, can I just pick up the two things that, that Susan said yeah, and, and ask, ask Susan a question about this? I mean, the, the two things I just want to touch on very quickly is, is your, Susan, what Susan was saying about U.S. policy in the region, but also domestic politics here in the U.S. And as it relates to the region. On, on the U.S. policy in the region, what has struck me, and, and you touched on this with the Houthi thing, uh, Susan, I get the sense that there is domestic political pressure coming on Biden to be stronger, for lack of a better word, because you hear the Republicans talking about that. But I actually do think there's also been a calculation internally that what they have been doing has not worked. Right, they have sent two aircraft carrier groups to the region. They have the very vocal to the Iranians: don't escalate, don't escalate, stop escalating. And it hasn't worked. You have the Houthis, who have been, as you said, uh, jamming up the Red Sea. You have Hezbollah, which has been very, very active in the northern border. Uh, and you now suddenly, in the last forty-eight, seventy-two hours, you've seen this strike in Baghdad, where they went after a a, a Shia militia, Iranian backed Shia militia in Baghdad. You see much more active. Uh, attacks uh, in the Red Sea, in Syria. My sense is that the Obama administration, even separate from the politics, has made a decision, uh, I'm sorry, the Biden administration has made a decision in the last couple of days that they just need to be tougher with the Iranians because what has worked, before, what has been going on before has not deterred them. It hasn't worked. The one thing I wanted to ask you, though, about Susan, because you said this, and I really picked this up as well, which is domestic political issues. My sense is also that they're not too concerned about the grump, grump, grumpiness on the left 
as it pertains to November. And I think I, that's right. That was your analysis. I agree with that. And I'm not sure that's wrong because I, my view of this is look, in general, I mean, we always talked about this foreign policy doesn't always doesn't really play in, in national politics. The one thing I think people are worried about is the Democratic shock troops, the ground game tends to be young people. And these are the ones who are most disillusioned with the Biden administration on Israel Hamas. But I do think November's a long time away, that by the time we're talking about ground game in the swing states, in a if, we're, if it's a Trump-Biden election, this is, this is something else will be atop of the agenda, be it probably Trump and some craziness he's talking about, be it abortion, which is obviously, I think, much more motivating, to be honest with you, with, with the young people in the U.S., than, than particularly the Democratic side, than Israel Hamas. So I guess my question to you, Susan, is, is are the Bidens making the wrong uh, calculation here that they don't need to worry about domestic politics when it comes to Israel's Hamas? Yeah, I mean, essentially, Peter, I agree with everything, you know, that you said. Um, just quickly on the uh, need to be tougher. Yeah, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think that that, that number of 100 attacks on U.S. interests and growing uh, indicates uh, a policy that didn't work so far. The, the phrase in the immediate aftermath of the attack uh, on October 7th was restore deterrence, that that was going to be kind of the, you know, shared uh, goal of the U.S. and Israel with the U.S., you know, playing outside of Israel's borders, playing that role primarily. Uh, and that uh, that hasn't uh, worked in the way that they would want it to. So I do think we're going to see uh, more uh, uh, aggressive or loud, you know, attempts by the U.S. to signal that uh, things have gone too far. Um on the domestic politics, it seems to me that uh, it's just not going to factor in right now. Uh, and of course, timing is everything. And that is why the friction is growing uh, in terms of the, the the White House dealings with, with Bibi. Uh, in the end, uh, you know, first of all, how uh, straightforward is he being or is the Israeli military being about their actual time frame? Uh, and, you know, from the beginning, they outlined a goal that many in the Pentagon and uh, many who, you know, know the region well militarily felt was not a realistic goal, the eradication of Hamas. Uh, and so then they almost started out from the beginning of this conflict, uh, you know, kind of in a hole of their own making. What would constitute victory? I still have that question. Uh, and I think that people in the White House have that question. What does victory look like at this moment for Israel? Yeah, I think that just uh, two points. And then, uh, Stefan, I really want to bring you in and and, and get uh, your perspective uh, on this and, of course, the European perspective. Uh, I, I think the administration when, was most concerned about escalation from the north, from Hezbollah. And that was what their focus was. Uh, and they were very careful to make sure that that didn't happen. And actually, they look at it now and they think they've been pretty darn successful. Um, and they, they thought this was actually going to blow up, uh, in a way, partly because of the Israelis, but partly because of Hezbollah, but they have turned and, and, and here they have not turned alone. They've turned with the, with the Europeans and Stefan, uh, it, it is, it is important and remarkable that the statement that was came out, uh, I guess the day before yesterday, uh, uh, of 12 nations now 14, uh, to say that if the Houthis don't, don't stop, the consequences are going to be severe signed by Germany, by Italy. Uh, by the Netherlands, uh, by the United Kingdom, uh, by the way, not by France, interestingly enough. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, this is a, no, not, and the French do have a navy there, um, and, and, the, and the Germans, I believe, don't and the Dutch. But, the, but the, you know, it's, it's, it, there is this coalition now that is really starting to take the Red Sea uh, issues uh, very seriously. So, Stefan, uh, one, on, on this question of escalation, uh, what is the perspective in Europe? And then, and then secondly, um, you know, Germany is kind of unique when it comes to the issue of, of Israel, given its own history and its own position. But the rest of Europe uh, is where much of the, frankly, the democratic left in the United States is uh, on the issue of Hamas and Palestine. And how is that going to have an impact uh, on, uh, on European policy, which tends to be forgotten, certainly in the U.S. debate, and, and shouldn't be? Well, honestly, I think um, the Europeans will not have a major impact on their pursuit of this war. Uh, and it's it's a kind of, uh, um, um, well, uh, telling, uh, listening to, to you Americans talking about the conflict uh, from a European perspective, because you already see that this is just a mirror of 
of the electrogens looming in, in, in the US themselves. Uh, but uh, if you ask me, this war will not be decided, the inner, the inner core of the war, the, the Gazan war, will not be decided by any kind of either European or even the American impact. Yes, there is pressure. There is tremendous pressure. Um, um, Blinken now is in the region again, Baerbock traveling there tomorrow. Uh, so there is a coordinated effort to put Netanyahu under pressure. But uh, the domestic uh, Israeli um, uh, mood is, is pretty coherent. It says we have to sort of finish things up. And Benny Gantz, being in the war cabinet, will pull the plug the moment he thinks worse things are behind them, and they can turn back to domestic politics. This will be the end of Netanyahu. This was where we might see the next elections coming in this year in Israel, and Benny Gantz emerging as the victor. And in the outer rim, sort of, the, the, the deterrence of Iran, the, the, the Red Sea issue, the Houthi issue, this is what basically, yes, we, the Americans, the Europeans, jointly do try to deter and keep under control. And don't underestimate the, the other Arab countries themselves. They haven't seen any country being on the side of Iran when this uh, IS um, 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 attack happened two days ago. Uh, and on the Houthi side, same, same picture there. They're totally isolated. So there is a, a sort of a two-ring situation. The outer war is contained. There's being sort of kept under control. I don't even see the Iranians being keen on engaging in the fight and the inner war, the Gazan war, the, uh, dealing off with Hamas and pot potentially even kind of Hezbollah um, will be determ determined entirely by the Israeli side uh, itself. Um, and yes, you're right on the broader European mood, especially on the left, but this will not impact the Israeli decisions at all. Uh, so this will be a major domestic issue for the Europeans, uh, keeps them busy in, in Brussels but it won't change the world. Uh, well, that's the, the, that's a you know one time when politics doesn't matter uh, uh, in, uh, in our conversation, and I really like your inner your inner war outer war uh, uh, idea, and I do think that the, the Biden administration in particular was very much focused on the outer war, and I think we underestimate the degree to which that that focus has been successful. Uh, and it's all well and good for uh, you know pol politicians to go out and say let's go beat up the Houthis. Uh, but you know how many Iranians are you going to kill when you do that, and and how does that lead to uh, uh, to containment, which is ultimately what we were about. Uh, and speaking of containment, Peter, in the in the few minutes we have left, the transition, uh, the transition. Yes, we always find we try to find transitions wherever wherever we can. Uh, 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 I mentioned in the outset, Taiwan election, of course, really big in terms of how uh, Xi Jinping uh, and 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 China is going to. Uh, react, but China writ large is, of course, remains a major, major political issue both in the United States, between the United States and its allies, and and, and within the whole region. Uh, and it uh, and just because we've had the Ukraine war and, of course, now the Middle East um, uh, sort of focus for so long doesn't mean that what is happening in that part of the world isn't important. Ultimately, as I think the Biden administration puts it, is the shaping threat. Uh, uh, and the only country that has the capacity and the intention to uh, to disrupt the world order, uh, it, it can't be ignored. Uh, it certainly isn't in the Republican campaign. Uh, I doubt it's going to be in uh, the presidential campaign. So, how do you see how do you see the situation up there? Well, let's remember where we left off. Right, we left off at the end of last year with sort of this very high profile meeting between Xi and Biden in San Francisco. It, there was a lot of good noises, not a huge amount of substance, but but you know the symbolism was important. Um, the prospect for 2024, I will start negatively, but I, I, I will pivot. Um, you, you pointed to there's the two big elections. I mean, big elections. So the Taiwanese elections are not big, but they have potential of being uh, important for, for geostrategic reasons. In that, um, as you pointed out in your opening remarks, Evo, you have a party in power, the Democratic progressives, which have traditionally been, I don't want to say pro-independence, but the rhetoric that comes out of that party is more independent than the opposition, Kuomintang. And they're, it's an election campaign, right? And in election campaigns, people say things that sometimes they don't mean for domestic political reasons. And Beijing, we know from past uh, history, pays very close attention to this. Any prospect of the DPP advocating for independence brings a huge backlash from Beijing. And we're already seeing pressure on, on Taiwan from that, that way. 
You look at the polls, it looks like the DPP will win again. Again, it's getting closer uh, as the weeks go on. Um, the Chinese would clearly prefer the KMT to win. My only point there is I'm not sure we need to watch the results of the election per se. What we need to watch is the rhetoric. Uh, and I think that is the potential trigger point. The Chinese may have to react to something the DPP says, and then the U.S. will have to react to that. And so that's why I think that the Taiwan elections are important to keep an eye on. The other election, obviously, is then November, uh, the U.S. election, because the same dynamic applies here, right? We know from four years ago and four years before that and four years before that, that heated rhetoric about China is always a prospect of U.S. presidential campaigns. And as you mentioned, Eva, we're already seeing it now in the in the Republican primaries with with uh, Haley and DeSantis going after each other over China. Who was softer on China? You know, what's what's Haley's record in South Carolina? What's DeSantis' record in Florida? This is going to be a heated rhetoric. So you have the, the the fear of heated rhetoric in Taiwan, the fear of heated rhetoric in the U.S. But I would still argue that despite the, those those dangers, that both Washington and Beijing have huge interests right now to continue the post-San Francisco trajectory, which is de-escalate, thaw. And here's why. I think both countries are coming from a position of weakness, for lack of a better word. The U.S. cannot right now, they're having a hard enough time managing, as we discussed, Israel and Hamas, having a hard enough time managing Ukraine. They do not need a third crisis over Taiwan, over China. They have an interest in, and they've been trying to do this now for 18 months, to de-escalate, de-escalate, de-escalate. The thing sometimes we forget is Beijing also has a similar incentive, right? Their, their economy is cratering. They have a debt crisis um, there's a real nervousness in Beijing about their ability to manage this. Um, there's a fear that that she miscalculated by by ramping up the, the rhetoric too hard and forgetting about the domestic economic situation. So what we're seeing, I think, and you've seen this, you know, in 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 Chinese outreach to Europe in particular, they are desperate to lower the temperature so that confidence re in the economy resumes, foreign capital flows resume. So my argument would be that both Washington and China, despite the, the dangers that reheated political rhetoric uh, present in 2024, have a huge interest in de-escalating over the course of the year. And that's why I'm a bit more optimistic on China-U.S. relations over the course of 2024 than perhaps I am on, on, on Ukraine or, or Israel-Hamas. Um, that will be my prediction. I know it's always very dangerous. I tend to get it wrong, but I'll throw that out there and and, and, and see what Stephen and Susan think. I, I, I think you know that's that was the intent in Bali, right, in November of twenty twenty. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, and it and and it was a balloon that that uh, that that set it off in the wrong way. And that blew it, it the wrong way. Yes. <laughs> and that blew the wrong way. I mean, Susan, how do you see? Do you see the politics ultimately? Uh, leading to confrontation or not confrontation? I mean, unlikely to have a war, uh, I think. In in in, in but but uh, uh, a return to uh, to significant conflict, uh, at least uh, politically and economically. Uh, or uh, do you see it the same way as Peter that, that despite the political rhetoric in the United States, both countries have an incentive to to de-escalate. Yeah, I just one quick comment and then a question for Peter. I do think that um, I be I broadly agree. And uh, I, I think it's notable that that Biden and his team with so many other crises uh, uh, on the international horizon in an election year, they seem to be more in managing this mode than they have been earlier in the administration. Uh, I did notice a uh, report today about extending uh, uh, um, uh, the tariffs uh, on China longer and possibly adding a few more to the mix. And, and, and this has been perhaps an unpredicted and, and relatively surprising development in, in now three years of the Biden administration, they have uh, chosen to have a much more kind of economic populist approach to China. I think many thought they might revert to a little bit more of a classic, you know, not, you know, right-wing free trade policy, but, you know, to ease some of that. And they have not done that. And I think that was primarily, in my view, probably for political rather than orthodox uh, economic reasons that they've chosen that. So I, I took that as a political signal this morning uh, in terms of their desire to manage this issue. My question, Peter, because I don't really know the answer and to everybody on this, uh, do we think that she is more interested in um, uh, another Biden term because it would at least be more stable and, you know, it's a more transparent, you know, kind of process to, to work with or, uh, you know, take take the bet on Trump because he's a volatile personality and always, uh, you know, might make the deal with his good friend, the strong man, Xi Jinping. Boy, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. I mean, look, what I know about Chinese diplomacy, which which is, which is, it changes, right? We had wolf warriors and then we didn't. Um, 
is they like predictability over anything, over everything else. And so the unpredictability of the, the, the Trump administration was incredibly unsettling for the Chinese. And I think despite the fact that Biden has been in many ways no less tough on China than, than, than Trump was, the predictability and the fact that there are engagements that can be, can be scheduled and there's a path, um, I think, uh, would, is, is, uh, something that, that, that the Chinese would prefer. I mean, on, on a counter flip, I mean, I just, I was actually in Japan, uh, end of last year and made the rounds, both the defense ministry and, and the, the national security council there. And it was always struck me that the, actually the Japanese were in many ways more pro Trump, uh, than pro Biden because they felt that, that Trump was tougher uh, in, in many ways on, on the Chinese instinctively than the Biden administration was, which makes me feel that the Chinese probably feel the opposite. So um, that, that, would be, that would be my prediction. I, I just, the one thing I would just add is, I, I don't want to, to overstate this, but I think the, just to reiterate, seems on the Financial Times guy, to reiterate the crisis, the self-created crisis the Chinese have made for, with their economy by both frightening Wall Street. I mean, you know, I, one of the tensions I remember I picked up a couple years ago was that there was a difference between New York and Washington about, about, about China policy. A lot of voices on Wall Street and frankly in Silicon Valley asking for uh, for less harsh because they want to do business in China. That doesn't exist anymore. They're, they're afraid of, of sending their people to China now. And the other thing is the Chinese in many ways have killed the goose that blowed the gold egg. They went after the tech sector, you know, Jack Ma, Alibaba. And I, I think a lot of that is coming home to roost now. And so I think that that they would be afraid of a Trump administration because of the prospects of re-escalation. And they, they do want to go on this path of, of, of tampering down uh, the relations because they, they have their own domestic issues to deal with right now. Uh, and I think that's top of their, top of their mind. Stefan, we don't have a lot of time left, but uh, uh, it seems to me that this 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 conversation is one that a European would say, "Yeah, that's the right direction. We would like to have stability between China and the United States." <laughs> and uh, uh, we may have slight differences about how much engagement there is, but even in Europe, uh, even in Germany, it seems to me there's a there's a, a greater realism about the economic challenges inside China and the consequences thereof uh, for investment and and the kind of engagement that used to be there. Uh, and it seems to be a possibility of alignment between Europe and the United States uh, in some ways uh, that we haven't, uh, you know, we thought it wasn't going to happen and it's happened because both sides have moved towards each other. Well, there are two crises in the world which we deal with, so we don't need a third one. That's the major line here. The second one is economic reading of China is exactly as Peter says, or they have enough domestic trouble to deal with. And over the past weeks, we saw Xi Jinping um, uh, refraining from, from troublemaking outside. We've seen a huge alignment in the southern sphere of China with all the neighbors there being uh, ganging up against China now, uh, Philippines and so on. And don't forget, there's even somebody uh, free riding on this is Kim Jong-un, who's firing like hell from his sh sh uh, shores and uh, trying to to spear trouble. And even the Chinese wouldn't like that either. So I my, my guess is, yes, if we keep tone under control, if there's no flaring rhetoric, uh, there might be a chance that this third major crisis can actually be avoided this year. Not next year. We don't know. Well, we're, I, we only do one year at a time here at World Review. So... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Stefan Cornelius of the Süddeutsche Zeitung, Susan Glasser of the New Yorker, and Peter Spiegel of uh, the Financial Times. Thanks to all three of you for uh, a really uh, great beginning uh, conversation. Not necessarily optimistic, though we ended up in an optimistic note. Thanks to Peter and Stefan and, and Susan. And thank you all for turning in, uh, tuning in and watching. Uh, we'll be back next week with another edition of World Review. Until then, have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>